Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back to Tokyo On Fire. Today is July 17th, 2015. Our burning issue today is the Liberal Democratic Party of Japan. The Liberal Democratic Party is the political party that's been in power since 1955. It's had a couple of、um, hiatuses out of power. We're going to be delving into why the Liberal Democratic Party is so powerful and what its influence is on Japanese politics. Today, I'm joined once again with my co host, Michael Chuchek. Michael Chuchek is the author of the foremost blog on Japanese politics in English. It is entitled Shisaku. He is an adjunct professor at Sofia University where he is teaching budding bright minds on Japanese and US politics. Michael, welcome to the show again. Well, it's great to be back. Thank you very much. We're talking about the LDP and their dominance in Japanese politics. They lost a little bit of a gap there. The prime minister came back roaring, Prime Minister Shinzo Abe, and he has reestablished his position. He's really kind of melding things to kind of bend to his ways. There's been a lot going on here. Well, the Prime Minister is riding on a wave of the LDP's return to power. The return to power was not guaranteed. And in fact, most people called them out in 2009 when they lost to the、D、Democratic Party of Japan,、mm -hmm. the DPJ. They have come back, but in a rather different form than the way they went out. And Mr. Abe has been. He has been helping build up the party, but at what might be a cost that it'll have to bear down the line.、Mm -hmm. Let's talk a little bit about the LDP, how it was formed, where it came from, and perhaps why it can so、uh, legitimately weld such political power in Japanese politics. It's been around since 1955 when two conservative parties,、uh, called the Liberal Party and the Democratic Party, merged. And the merger was forced upon them by the merger of two of the socialist parties. The concept that Japan needed to be under conservative rule was something that, well, it's, it's not something that the Japanese people necessarily have、uh, held as a unified whole, but nevertheless is the basic line. That is both acceptable to the United States, Japan's major ally, and also to the Jap Japan's business community.、Mm -hmm. These two forces, along with politicians, ha are, have been basically deciding how Japan has been run for the, well, basically since 1945. Right. And it's not incorrect to say that the United States had a heavy hand in. Melding this, this kind of formation of the Liberal Party and the Democratic Party so that、uh, the, the economy could get on its feet, so that Japanese politics could settle down, and so that the, the constitutional framework could begin to operate for the benefit of the、uh, Japanese constituency. Well, Japanese conservatives, of course, had a, a big burden in that they were, of course, of course, associated with the march toward war that took place in the 1930s and 1940s. And one would think initially that the United States would really want to cause their power to, well, to, to crumble away. But then, of course, the Cold War intervened, which made their anti communism far more important than their historical legacy.、Mm -hmm. So the United States actually helped fund, through the Central Intelligence Agency, the early years of the, the、uh, unified party. Well, that's not too different than what happened in Germany, too. I mean, a lot、well, so、of the intelligence. It, 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 now that we ha have open archives from the time, the, the,、uh, the 30 or 40 year gap has, has、uh, ended, we've seen that the United States had a very, very strong influence, if not a controlling hand, in the arrangement of the conservative parties,、mm -hmm. at least in their first years. Later on, in, in the 1960s, they took off on their own. Well, the LDP did because it was able to take credit for the huge economic boom, the,、mm -hmm. the times when there were 10% per annum growth rates and economy, you know, the person's income would actually double over a 10 year span. They could take credit for that, and they were, at the time at least,、uh, given the benefit of the doubt. One has to know, though, that the LDP has not been a popular party. For, during its first 30 years of existence,、uh, it rarely went above 35% in terms of the total number of votes, or at least the total number of persons、uh, saying that they were、mm -hmm. supporters of the party. And right now, that we have that exact same number, 35%,、uh, so that it has been, never been 
a party of the majority of a Japanese citizens. Mm -hmm. It has always been of about the, the party of about a third of the electorate at best. And in, in, its, in its dark days, it was down into the 20s, into the low 20s in terms of percentages of supporters. Mm -hmm. Now, how did it stay in power? Well, that's a completely different story. Uh, it's not, and it has many different parts and we'll just go in, we'll be getting into it. Right, well, one of the great things about um, our session, our, our videos on Tokyo on Fire is that we can dive into some of these issues and explain them. Perhaps a lot of the people who are watching this video, they have a, a, a good knowledge of, of the background and maybe the implications, but it's always nice to kind of wrap these things together. And it can be said that the LDP is basically the party for big business. Bus it's a business favorable political party. And I think they address and, and respond to the needs of big business, K. Donnellan and, and that sort of thing. But going back into the past, it's really interesting to note that the, the leader of the Democratic Party and the leader of the uh, Liberal Party have uh, sons and grandsons who have continued to be in, in Japanese politics and are leaders even today. Well, the, the, all the countries in the world, including the United States now, we have Hillary Clinton, uh, who's going to maybe be running against yet another Bush. Mm -hmm. uh, the, these, all c countries have these dynastic uh, families that are somehow in meritocratic democratic states somehow are still dominant. Mm -hmm. uh, but Japan is right off the scale in many ways. It really ways. is, isn't it? it? East Asia is pretty bad in terms of dynastic politics. In fact, if you look around the region, almost everyone is a dynast son or grandson. The Philippines. But the Philippines, right. China, North Korea, South Korea. Yes. Uh, now, it makes a certain amount of sense. I mean, if, if my father, my grandfather, my great-great-grandfather were pioneers or who were, who were heroes. Oh, Lee Kuan Yew, the founder of Singapore, so his son is now mm -hmm. the, the prime minister. The, the, yeah, there, that there are heroes and founders all around. Yes, that's true. But nevertheless, it's, it's an oppressive system, and in Japan it's particularly bad. Mm -hmm. That there, it is very hard for newcomers to break in, and it's particularly hard for newcomers in the LDP, except, as we had in 2009, when they get wiped out. And that's one of the new things about the LDP in, the, in 2015, is that the crowd the, 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 that is supporting the prime minister is particularly young, and they've had very few elections, maybe one, maybe mm -hmm. two elections to the diet. Uh, and this group uh, is ahistorical in its, both its youth and often in the terms numbers. of its numbers, and its loyalty to the prime minister. Mm -hmm. Previously, loyalties have been split up in, in the factions, right. the factions which are informal. There's nothing in the LDP charter that talks anything about factions, right. but you cannot talk about the LDP without talking about them. They were the vehicles by which LDP leaders were able to jostle amongst each other and to come to some kind of decision which who would lead and who would serve in the cabinet. Right. Essentially, factional cliques that are cobbled together or, or that circle around uh, a central person who has charisma, power, money, who has got a, a legacy of some sort. And who is aiming for the prime minister's right. chair. And that th there would was for decades and decades an alternation between these individuals mm -hmm. and competition between them. And in order to make, to, to give them ground forces, they coalesced around themselves using money, using charisma, using mostly the ability to get into the formal administrative right. structure, a, a way of getting to get all, your team together so you could take on other teams inside the LDP. So that the LDP, you may talk about it as a party, but it's actually an entire political sure. system. Mm -hmm. It's as if a single party is the political system that you normally have in a, in a, a, a combative uh, an extremely competitive system that you normally see in a country, the LDP is its own country in a sense, mm -hmm. and that it has political forces that are fighting it out. I think the country analogy is, is really um, a, a good one because some of the factions inside the LDP, in fact, are bigger than some of the opposition parties. That's exactly true. Right. And, they, and they are 
much more important mm -hmm. than opposition parties and the uh, views of their leaders. Now, that's not so true in 2015 as it was, let's say, even 10 years ago when the factions, in fact, when there would be a cabinet reshuffle or a, a new prime minister, would go to this person who was supposedly in charge and say, you're going to pick this person, this person, this person, because he has six elections to the diet, it's never been in the cabinet, this person has five and is a specialist in medical equipment, so you're gonna put him as, as the minister of health, and they would dictate to this newly elected leader what exactly he would be doing before he, in, in the very most simple and we would think most important act, which is picking his own cabinet. Right. Well, there's been a shift in, in the power balance, and I think we've, we've noticed that um, even more remarkably since this last election, that currently the LDP now is really the, the center of gravity for defining political bills, for uh, parceling out uh, uh, positions of authority and power even within the cabinet. And there's a, even when, when you're doing your lobbying activities or, or going to members of the diet, uh, they can give comments and you can, you can facilitate certain um, movement, but the real power is, is now centered in the LDP very securely. The LDP is so powerful that it doesn't even have to try anymore. That's the real story behind what's going on in the diet right now. Mm -hmm. There actually doesn't have to be a single day's debate of any piece of legislation. Right. They have the votes. Mm -hmm. They could go up, down, mm -hmm. and say, okay, we want this particular bill to become law. Bang, they can do it. They are so confident, though, that they go through the motions of having a debate mm -hmm. in order to make it look nice, in order to, make, to not make waves and say, look, we've had this debate. We've had so many, so many hours of people yelling about this particular bill, and then they vote for it. Right. And they can extend the debate entirely for political purposes, just to make it look as though there is an actual functioning d democratic process. That might have worked in the past. I think um, the voters seem to be a little bit more sophisticated, and certainly the, the press and the, the public vehicles for decimating information are a little bit more active in digging these things out. For example, when Conte criticizes the media for writing pieces or uh, making observations or giving a negative comment, and that hammer comes down, that's really caused them a problem. Yeah, well, that, that's true. That there is, there's, there is in, inside some, either Mr. Abe or the chief cabinet secretary this, this war going mm -hmm. on in terms of you don't have to press, you don't have to push, mm -hmm. because you have all the votes you need. Right. You really don't have to put, bring the hammer down. And nevertheless, they've been doing it. They have uh, really taken sledgehammers to butterflies, especially in terms of press coverage. Mm -hmm. Uh, commenting, suggesting, okay, they sent out a letter, and the, the party members sent out a letter before the uh, December election saying, we expect you to be fair and balanced in your reporting to all of the major news agencies. Mm -hmm. Of course, they, it was, and it was a, supposedly a, a secret message. Of course, the news agencies all leaked it and said, look at, look at look this. Look at the heavy look, hand. Look at these people yeah. with, the, with the, the iron fist, yeah. no glove at all. What are they doing? Uh, that there is a, that's a really p peculiar aspect of the of the uh, current administration, and it might even just be psychological. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that helps make the LDP the party to hate because once they have power, then they wield it unfairly, or they wield it without regard for uh, competing forces or the the other opposition parties. Well, it might actually go to their advantage to that in a weird kind of way, in that, as well, Machiavelli says, it's better to be feared than to be loved. Mm -hmm. And well, if you can throw your weight around and intimate, not necessarily do these things, but intimate that you're going to at some point, if, the other, if whatever social force, be it the press, be it academ academics, whatever, mm -hmm. uh, suddenly rise up that they can be squashed, uh, it's instead of actually doing it, just being able to hint that you sure. could do it might be in, in their interest. Well, uh, once again, we're talking about the LDP and why the LDP has been in power for so long. And I think we've seen this time and time again. Even when the LDP was out of power, the party that came in didn't know how to rule. They didn't know how to use these tools and these tactics and to 
intimate what they were going to do or project what they might do in order to get what they wanted. Well, they didn't scare anyone. In no, the case they didn't. of the DP, DPJ, they, they campaigned on being decent and honest and fair. Mm -hmm. And they tried to rule that way. Uh, it turns out this is a very difficult country to rule if uh, you, you play you know, play fair and play nice. Mm -hmm. uh, you do have to have a certain degree of intimidation mm -hmm. in order to get things done. And the electorate lost faith in the LDP, I mean, I'm sorry, in the DPJ, and in fact in all opposition parties sure. due to the 2009-2012 experience where it turned out that the establishment, the business establishment, the agricultural establishment, the, the bureaucracy, the bureaucracy could all shut down mm -hmm. an, a, a duly elected government and make it impossible for them to do their, not, it was not necessarily malicious or, or entirely evil, but nevertheless make it extremely difficult for mm -hmm. this party, which had come in on popular, uh, with a great deal of, of popular confidence, with very, very high levels of support, uh, in terms of the cabinet at least, uh, to be just absolutely shut down. Mm -hmm. uh, and the, the United States did not help. That's, this was due, of it's course. It's a tough period, wasn't it? Well, in the case of, of the first prime minister for the DPJ, uh, Hatoyama, he tried to reverse, all at one go, uh, 30, 40 years of the United States forces being based in Okinawa, and at the same time, the very fraught relationship with China. He tried to do both at the same time, and the United States government looked at that and said, this guy is trying to undermine the Japan-US alliance, mm -hmm. and we have nothing to do with him. And at that point, he, was, he froze himself out. Mm -hmm. But getting back to the LDP, the LDP, we, we really have to say, first of all, that the LDP is a party whose sole purpose nowadays uh, is to represent power and to, to you know, accrete power to itself. Right, to be, number one, to be re-elected, to have your members re-elected, but also to dominate, to not rely on a coalition party to get your bills through the, the parliament. That's their dream. They've mm -hmm. had to rely on coalitions since 1994 when they joined with the socialists, their arch enemies, to get back in power. They were out of power for a brief period in 93. Mm -hmm. And they were willing to reach across the aisle to their deadliest foe, the socialists to bring in a coalition, and they've been in coalition ever since. And again, that's a, a reflection of the fundamental paradox of this of this party is that it's not a popular party. It actually has to have at sure. least one ally mm -hmm. to stay in power. Mr. Abe is trying to change that dynamic and make it an absolute big tent party, but a big tent party that is nevertheless not one that brings lots of citizens, lots of the people who are not involved in politics in. Mm -hmm. It's a big tent party of exclusion. Right. Which, is, which, which should blow people's minds. Well, it's very much like the press club uh, scenario too, where unless you're a member, you're not gonna get in and you're not gonna be able to write the stories, you're not gonna have the inside track. Yeah, and, and Abe has been, he has been consolidating in the party in, in many ways. It has its roots in rural areas mm -hmm. and in, far, in supporting the farmers, but with farmers being now very old and, and soon to be very, very few in, in, Jap, in Japan, it's really, he's really moved the party back to its real roots, which is the business. The business, right. Group. And it's naked, it's blatant, people talk about it all the time, and they say, you know, everything you've done is, your abenomics, right. your womenomics, all it is is to facilitate the activities uh, exactly. of, of big business for mm -hmm. the Nippon Keidan Ren and for other uh, organizations. You know, it's just, and he never has to say, yes, you're right, but basically that's what he does. Sure. He says, well, you know, I'm, I'm, here to I'm here to help Japan's recovery, right. which, is, which, is, which is code. Mm -hmm. and no one, Maybe outside of Japan, that should, is understood as, oh, he's, he's working to reform the economy. It's really code for, I'm going to facilitate life for Japanese corporations. And I think his, uh, the, the people who belong to his party, or maybe the independents who might, might join his party, because there's a, there's a real chance there, 
uh, in upcoming elections, and it's a, a big, well, big certainly prize. if the Japan in Innovation Party right. explodes again mm -hmm. for the umpteenth time, uh, <laughs> the uh, there will be recruits that sure. will be available to beef up further beef up what is already an immense party. Mm -hmm. The the funny thing though is that although the prime minister is not. He's not really known as a charismatic leader. He's but, not. He's but a, he, he, yeah, he's, he simply has, he has very little charisma. But he has been able to uh, successfully gather the forces that cobble together to make something that is um, a justifiable and representative uh, power base for the LDP. And, he, and, it, at the, and doing it while wiping out all rivals. Yes. Now, Normally, when you put together a coalition, you have to bring in a lot of big, mm -hmm. big enchiladas and big cheeses and bring them in, and you have to deal with them. He brings them in, and then he cuts off their heads. Yes. And it, if you go through all the people who, has, who have tried to, in some way, compete with him in terms of power in the, over the last three years, mm -hmm. they're all, they're all yes. in the wilderness. Yes. They're, they're, they're either in extremely minor party positions or very minor uh, Ministries, poor Mr. Ishiba, right. with his his rural renovation ministry work, which is getting no going nowhere. Mm -hmm. uh, but all of the the major sure. persons who could have possibly been centers of opposition, the traditional factional centers of opposition, mm -hmm. we don't talk about the heads mm -hmm. of factions. They they're there. That's right. But they're not seen in any way mm -hmm. as rivals or potential new prime ministers. Well, I think their their strategy is let's just wait and bide our time. I mean, they're they're trying to gather their forces too. You know, well, that's what the Chinese are, were thinking too, but even yes. they, they even they've given that up. They're right. they're willing to meet Abe now. Yes. Xi Jinping is finally saying, yeah, 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 yeah. Might not be a bad idea. Yeah, might, he somehow is still in power. Most Japanese prime ministers It's they, true. It is true. He is the longest serving prime minister since since Koizumi and he's he's going to be well on up there on the, the total number of days as a prime minister list. He's already, I think, in fifth place mm -hmm. in, in the post-war era. And uh, he'll be shooting past a lot of folks, including, including Ikeda. He's not going to get up to the level of his, his great uncle, or his uncle, great uncle, uh, Sato, who has the longest tenure. But uh, he's, he's definitely going to do very, very well in historical terms. Mm -hmm. You mentioned just a little while ago Prime Minister Hatoyama. And it, it reminds me again of this hereditary nature of Japanese politics. And yes, although it is represented in politics throughout the world, in Japan it's a little bit, um, it's a little bit heavy on, on that. And in particular with the LDP, the LDP has about 50% of the sitting members of the Diet either have a father or a grandfather or some close relationship that has helped guide them into Japanese politics. And so, Hatoyama, even though he was a DPJ prime minister, it, his, you know, his family were LDP mm -hmm. members and he started out in the LDP and that's another aspect. An opportunity. We talk about the opposition in Japan, but the major centrist opposition is really just pieces of the LDP that fell off at some mm -hmm. point in the past. Right. So that the DPJ is really, it's half of what was the Takeshita faction sure. and that split off at that in the, in the 1990s. Mm -hmm. And it's the main opposition, but it's really just a flavor of the LDP. Well, it's a lot like Japanese society. I mean, there, there are strata of economic groups in Japan, but it's not wide like in the United States. It's, it's very narrow. And even though you might have uh, deviations from, from the standard norm, those deviations are not that great. I mean, even between the communists and the socialists and the socialists and the LDP, it's... If between the communists and the LDP, the, 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 the differences in terms of policy, right. are, they're, not, they're not black and white. Right, which <laughs> makes this discussion about the LDP so interesting and, and so intriguing. How and why could the LDP glom onto political power and be able to hold on to it for so long. Well, you could call it very seriously the most successful political party in the world, mm -hmm. by, bar none. Its only rival in terms of longevity is Mexico's PRI. And even they've not, they've had times out of power, for, or at least more recently have been out of power more often than the LDP has. Mm -hmm. The LDP is simply an institution within Japanese society. And you would want, in terms of the electoral system that Japan took on in 1993, which is 
what's called a first past the post. Basically, mm -hmm. it's it's like the House of Representatives in the United States, a small area of a certain geographical area with one person representing that particular space. That's the way the, the new Japanese system of 1993 was, and you would want, in order for that to be a vital policy generating system, several competing to, to have, candidates, to have at least have two competing candidates. Yeah, so that two would be nice. Two would be nice. <laughs> Three would be really interesting. Yes, but at least have two. But basically, in the system that has evolved, what we have is one, and that mm -hmm. one is the LDP candidate. Right, and. We have to go back one step in, and point out that in all the political maneuvering that has happened in regards to the, uh, the legislation that is up to, for debate, which has been a big fight over whether the legislation is constitutional or not, you have to go back one step and say that the diet that's trying to determine this. Is that constitutional? Is too? it constitutional? Right. Because according to the oh, Supreme Court, that's a great Court, point. That's a great according point. to the Supreme Court, the people who are sitting in these seats mm -hmm. are actually there in violation of the Constitution right. because the district boundaries mm -hmm. are overly pushed and pulled in a way so as to favor the LDP and overly favorable toward rural votes. Right, and it's not exactly gerrymandering. Right, gerrymandering is is completely different. This is this is the dynamics of electing a leader and having somebody come in as a candidate to represent uh, a thought or a theory or a, a position, a political issue. And usually, it's not. It's just a political party sends in a candidate, and you will be our candidate in this district. Yeah, the, 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 they're not drawing right. really bizarrely shaped uh, and, and 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 long twisted shapes like that. The gerrymander. Often they're just quite compact right. and very reasonable looking. But the problem is, is that inside them can be very small populations. Mm -hmm. There's no regulation that says what the, the correct population mix should be. So that an urban district of a certain size and a, and a, a rural district can have very different populations in them. Mm -hmm. And the Supreme Court has had to, over the last few decades, continuously suggest to the LDP, it's time to give urban voters more votes. Mm -hmm. And they've had been giving them suggestions, okay, it should be that an urban voter's vote at first was should be at least worth one third of a rural voter. Right. And then it said, okay, let's try to make it half, you know, so that there would be twice as many people in, a, in an urban district as in a rural district. Let's at least try to get that kind of balance, which mm -hmm. is no balance at all. Right. And that's the current level. And even that, the LDP has not been able to engineer except under the most bizarre mm -hmm. uh, ca counting systems of, 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 of uh, citizens. Mm -hmm. So that if you live in a city in Japan, you are a half citizen. Vote wise. Vote wise. Mm -hmm. As compared to someone who lives in a rural right. district. You are a, you have half as much of rights. You have half of the claims on the government's goodies and, and the things that they can hand out. Mm -hmm. And that's the what the system that the LDP likes. It's the system sure. that has kept them in power. And until somebody comes in and says this has got to stop, one would suppose it would be the Supreme Court, but when given the chance, they've always they've stepped back. Right. And in the most recently, they've said, no, this is not an unconstitutional mm -hmm. system. It's a system in a state of unconstitutionality. Right. Which is not the same thing. It's not right. the same thing. Because if it was unconstitutional, as we just pointed out, then the only group that can fix the, the system is the diet members who are themselves unconstitutional. It's a little bit of a logic game. Right. But nevertheless, the, 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 that's what judicial procedure is, and they're thinking all the time, okay, these folks, they're, the system that elects them is incredibly illegitimate. Mm -hmm. It really degrades and, and, and absolutely demoralizes rural, vo I mean, urban voters, right. saying you're half people. Mm -hmm. And that's, the, that's always been in the LDP's interest. Uh, the, the Supreme Court has suggested it's time to stop doing that. But the LDP, of course, for its own interests, for its yeah. own electability, has not ever been proactive on right. that. Right. I, I think it's actually a little bit more stark than that. For example, 
of 120 of a population, national population of about 120 million people, mm -hmm. most people say about 12 million live in Tokyo and in the environs mm -hmm. of, of Tokyo. Well, Tokyo, it, 13 million live in, in Tokyo metropolitan. Yeah. Right. So if you extrapolate that just a little bit, I mean, within a two hour drive of Tokyo, it's probably 20 million people. And that probably you could you can say 35 even. Okay. That portion, that's, that's a big metropolitan area. It dominates economy, politics, everything about Japan. I mean, you come to Japan and you visit Tokyo. It's not really Japan, but it is a good representation. I mean, 30 yeah. out of 120 million or? Yeah, it's, it, it's basically a quarter of the population, a third of the GDP. Huge. And yet, mm -hmm. in terms of representation in the diet, right? they are a minor force. I want to talk about what that translates into, into the situation that we have going on today. But before I do, just for the sake of completeness, let's talk a little bit about the difference between the LDP as a political force and the bureaucracy. The bureaucracy is supposed to be separate from politics. It's not supposed to be um, involved or influenced or touched by politics, but in fact, it is. But of the pillars of, of uh, Japanese society that support this whole this whole nation, the the bureaucratic pillar is one that's very strong, very deep, and it's it's been in existence far longer than the democratic constitution has been in Japan. The bureaucracy in Japan deserves a great deal of credit sure. for the the Japan that we have today. Uh, in other countries where democratization, rapid democratization, took place, there were frequently breakdowns and civil war, uh, terrorism, such things. In Japan, however, in the post-1945 era, they were able to take up the mantle of a completely democratic society from a totalitarian one like that. What made that possible was the organization of the bureaucracy from the very top levels all the way down to the, the village level. The they, Japanese juggernaut. They were able to just, okay, we've got a new boss, fine. Mm -hmm. There are new rules, fine. We know, we'll just fill out our forms, and we'll stamp things, and we will arrange how the government works, and they were able to switch on a dime, mm -hmm. absolutely just zip over. Right. And they deserve a tremendous amount of credit, and that the importance of the bureaucracy should be a part of any kind of analysis of politics and democracy. Right. In the case of the LDP, however, the idea that the bureaucracy could stay outside politics was not, is naive. Mm -hmm. And we've talked about the factions, which are informal. They're not a part of the formal structure. Also are the tribes, the zilku, mm -hmm. which are... Industry tribes, or technical tribes. Yeah, right? which are line, they are groups, not, they are not the same thing as the faction. The factions are aligned with a single leader and a competition for the leaders leadership position. The factions are and the, the tribes, the tribes are can be cross-factional. Mm -hmm. Groups of LDP members who The are, aviation tribe. They are right. They are interested in a particular- the automobile. They are interested in a particular industry mm -hmm. or in, 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 most often they are a complete reflection of a ministry. So right. that there is the health tribe, there is the construction tribe, the, each one reflects a ministry and they become policy experts in the, the policies of the ministry, and the ministry's bureaucrats become familiar mm -hmm. with these particular politicians, and together with the, the business interests that are represented, form what's called the Iron Triangle, mm -hmm. where business talks to the bureaucracy, talks to the politicians, the politicians talk to the businessmen, talk to the, 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 the ministry right. through their tribal uh, organization, and the, the, the three work together to create policies that benefit all three of them. Right. So that the bureaucracy, while it's supposed to be a meritocracy and supposed to be beyond politics, nevertheless, under the system designed by the LDP or that fostered by the LDP, is deeply embedded. This is not a revolving door, though, is it? Oh, no, it's not the same thing as it's the United not, States. Right. Though there is, of course, a large number of high-level bureaucrats who do make the jump into politics mm -hmm. at a later date. But they normally, those people are normally become governors. Right. Or they, and that's where they make their jump or they become local or, or municipal or prefectural officials. Right. 
only in, recently the number of bureaucrats who actually make the jump into national politics is relatively small. Right, because in order to accumulate power, you have to be successful in an, an election. You have to have three or four elections under your belt. I mean, to even qualify for a, uh, a position on the cabinet, um, you're probably well into your 80s uh, if, you've, if you've had a career as a, as a bureaucrat. Well, in the case, that's right. If the, you, you would be starting out as a 50-year-old freshman right. at, the, at best. Mm -hmm. And you're going to be competing, in the case of people like Abe, against persons who started out near the, the legal limit, starting out at 26, 27 years of age, and have all these decades of seniority mm -hmm. on you. So that's not really an attractive career choice as right. it once was. It was attractive particularly for people who wanted to join the DPJ because then you could actually become somebody important in that party. Mm -hmm. But it, coming into the LDP nowadays is no longer a, a very attractive. It was for a while, but it is no longer a major uh, force. Well, just to kind of complete that discussion, I think the reason for that is because typically when Japanese people enter the workforce, it is with the mind. I mean, I guess everybody has the mind. I want to be successful. I want to be good at, at the skill that I have decided I'm going to anchor my career on. But in Japan, I think it's a little bit more heightened. I'm going to do this. I'm going to join the bureaucracy. And I'm going to be in the bureaucracy until my career ends. And similarly with a lawyer or with any sort of technician or an industry specialist, there really isn't that circulation, this kind of revolving door at the political level is not represented even at the, the lower levels. Well, there's certainly no revolving door than that you can have a kind of career that reflects the three-year uh, or four-year cycle in terms of House of Representatives elections. Mm -hmm. That you can jump in when, it, when an election takes place, serve a, a particular politician or a particular party, and then jump back out again right. when the next election cycle happens, as is the case in many other countries. Here, if you jump out, you're, you're jumping out for good. Mm -hmm. And that was indeed, for a long time, a, very, a great attraction for bureaucrats. It's not so much anymore. Right. Uh, so that, in, to, in the, the general sense, the bureaucratic triangle with industry and the politicians is perhaps not as important as it was, and the tribes certainly due to reforms in the 1990s, their complete domination of policy making within the LDP uh, has diminished mm -hmm. so that the prime minister and his staff and the people that are loyal to him, uh, especially starting with the Khoisami era uh, in the, around the turn of the millennium, that's when the prime minister suddenly became an, a, a force in Japanese society. The, the Iron Triangle is pretty much a lip service issue now as compared to what it was in the 80s, pre, 90s. In the, in the, yeah, in the 80s and 90s. Huge, yeah. huge uh, focus of complaint and criticism from uh, J Japanese trading partners. And, and also from, from the Japanese people themselves, right. which was why the LDP even bothered to reform the ministries, mm -hmm. right. because the, the, they sensed that if they kept trying to do things the way they, they had been, they were in, I mean, they, they always talked about increasing efficiency to right. be more responsive, but basically they th saw it as an electoral issue. Right. I think, uh, you know, th I'm, I'm afraid to be criticized for navel gazing, which mm -hmm. we sometimes uh, mm -hmm. um, tumble into, but uh, the election system here in Japan, it is, it is rather unique, it's complex, and it, it could stand to be a, a burning issue at some point in time. Uh, for Tokyo on fire. I think it might be a little bit early now. We've got a, a, an election coming up in the upper house next year. Mm -hmm. um, maybe uh, as we approach that, it would be a good time to, to talk about that and to delve into that. But Well, it's currently an issue in the Diet because they're trying to reform the House of Counselors. Now, the, the, the Supreme Court has declared not just the House of Representatives, but the House of Counselors as being in a state of unconstitutionality, mm -hmm. that the electoral system has districts that are radically geared against urban voters and that that's unfair, or at least it's unconstitutional or in a state of unconstitutionality as regards this, the part of the Constitution that declares that everyone is equal yes, we, under the law. We will say that, but we won't say, in fact, it is unconstitutional because that just depends on what the definition of is. Is, is. right. Yes. In this case, the... Uh, the current diet is trying to find a way to rectify the House of Counselors. Now, the, the House of Representatives would actually be 
super easy. All you have to do is draw the boundaries so that every district has the same number of folks in it. And you can do that. Which there, would be great if it was a rather stable and a bit, population it, base. It's, it's, it's really, well, oh yes, po but populations change all over the world. And when you have a, that's the reason why you have censuses to find mm -hmm. out where people have moved to or where they've disappeared from. Sure, okay. But we're in a dynamic flux right now. Yeah, we're in a dynamic sure. flux right now so that it's, it's, it's actually quite rapid, the changes. You're right. And they, they should be making, redrawing these boundaries even faster. Yeah. But basically just getting them equal would mm -hmm. be a good start. And it's doable. However, in the House of Counselors, it's based upon not boundaries that they draw, but, but, but the boundaries that exist within the, the structure of, of the, the government, which is the prefectures. Mm -hmm. And just in the same way that United States states, you have Wyoming, which is worth in the United States Senate as much as California, even though the population of Wyoming is in the hundreds of thousands and, and, and California is near 40 million, they're equal. Right. The, the same is true in Japanese prefectures. You have mm. prefectures like Totori or Shimane, which have a few hundred thousand people in them, and then the prefecture of Tokyo, which has 13 million. There are some aspects of adjustment, but for the most part, you're going to have vast disparities mm -hmm. just because they're based on the prefectures. Right. And they're working, trying to work out a system to equalize, it's, and it's not going anywhere. Mm. Uh, unfortunately for the Abe administration, because it has spent so much political capital and so much of its popularity on the security legislation, it's actually finding itself in a position where it actually has to deal with this House of Counselors issue, which they'd really rather bury. Right. But they're so down, they have to start looking like reformists mm -hmm. somewhere. Yep. Of course, one, what you and I would want is get back on economic reform. Right. You know, if, if you want to be a reformist, get that train going, but that train's mm. going nowhere. Sure. Well, which kind of justifies or explains why the governorship of the prefectures is, is, is so popular and so powerful and so hotly contested nowadays. Well, it's certainly, the, it's a lot of fun too. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it, it's one of those jobs where you get to go and do all kinds of fun things, but the responsibilities are relatively small because there has not yet been enough devolution of power right. and especially taxation power mm -hmm. to the prefectures and the municipal levels. There is constant lip service to that. There is constant reform that's supposedly ongoing, but at the end of the day, they are basically either sinecures or, or they're basically training areas for people who want to get into national right. politics. Right, which is not a bad gamble either. Mm -hmm. um, talking about uh, the governor of Osaka, who just recently uh, threw in the towel, and what's going to become of him? Well, all, there are so many governors nowadays that, that actually have interesting policy implications and, and who actually do stuff. But again, they, they took on the position usually because they were able to win, not due to the LDP's strength, which is the way you work in national politics, but due to per personal right. attractiveness mm -hmm. or a certain kind of uh, private political base. Mm -hmm. So that the governorships of the prefectures are a, really a different kettle of fish, and it's really difficult to uh, talk about them in terms of the LDP. Right. Let's segue into how the LDP dynamic reveals itself in what we've got today. We're in the middle of a uh, diet session that has been extended far into, uh, into September. Um, Longest extension ever. And uh, the LDP was able to successfully do that without too much of a bump in the road. And now things are really starting to happen. Bills have been put into the lower house, they've been passed, they're now in, in uh, the upper house under deliberation, and if they're passed, they become law. But there's a lot going on, uh, the protests uh, happening in Kasumagaseki, just uh, less than five kilometers from here. We can hear them in the evenings shouting about uh, the revision of the Constitution, and there's a, it's a really a, a hot summer. Well, luckily, the Constitution's not being revised, or it would be an extremely hot summer, and uh would we'd be talking about possibly the government falling. Mm -hmm. But Abe and company have kept their, well, their ambitions in check and are going for small scale uh, bills at the present time. Nevertheless, it, it, they are passing bills using the majority that they have. And 
again, it's really, it shows that they have this particular group, that the leadership group around Abe, have a very clear sense of both personal confidence and a sense of how a, well, a show should be put on. You really mm -hmm. need to have long, period of, long periods of debate, even if they're pointless and meaningless and the uh, you have to go through the motions. You have to go through the motions, and they have. And they, what they're going to do in September when they lock up the last pieces of legislation in a rapid series of railroaded votes, bam, 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 after the other, they'll say, look, we, we extended the session all the way across the, the summer. It's the longest session ever. You can't say to us that we didn't properly discuss these mm -hmm. things. You can't say it because we've given you all this time. Uh, that the discussions themselves were not pertinent or that the, United, that the LDP simply stonewalled mm -hmm. when it was confronted with issues that it didn't want to talk about, with the, uh, with, uh, the diet testimony being not only contradictory but just inane. Mm -hmm. They'll say, look, we've, given, we've, we've, we've gone through the, the proper democratic procedures. You cannot criticize us. It's time to, to vote right. on these things. And bang, they they do it, and right. and, and you got to give them credit. Sure, okay. They don't necessarily have to do this. They can really run this as a tyrannical system. Kind of. I mean, it is a coalition government, and you can imagine that behind the scenes, in closed door sessions, there's a, a bit of a trading going on between the LDP and, and their coalition the partner. Yeah, and these some of these. Uh, divisions of power or authority or divvying up pork barrel projects has occurred and now they can move forward. Well, there, as long as the Komeito has a, a, a ministry that it can derive some kind of benefit from, it used to be that they'd like to be in, in charge of construction, now mm -hmm. they'd like to be in charge of health care. Uh, Which means that one of their leaders is assigned as the minister, cabinet minister, minister for, for that, that particular, that, that, uh, particular that, that, uh, ministry. As long as they have one of those right. things, they can go to their voters and say, look, we, we are apart. If, if we go into opposition, we'll get nothing. Mm -hmm. So that when the pressure comes from the voters saying, yeah, but you're acceding to everything that the LDP says, and they say, yeah, well, that's the trade-off, that's politics. Mm -hmm. So... Yes, they may be, may, there may be pressure from the, the Kometo, but at the end of the day, the Kometo has on it a pair of handcuffs. Sure. And that pair of handcuffs is they want to be in government. Right. Speaking of handcuffs, and just to kind of wrap this, this uh, discussion up, it's a little bit of a segue. Um, flared up big time this week, the uh, Olympic Stadium issue. That, uh, that really snowballed just almost overnight. It, it's been, you could see it coming. Mm -hmm. When Abe named Mr. Mori, his former faction leader, who's in his 80s, as... Oh, that was a long time ago. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> and it, but who's, who's, he's, who's, I think, 83 now, mm -hmm. I, but, but in his 80s. And Same then, faction. And, and his, and his, well, his, his, fa his former faction leader as the head of the committee, and then as his lieutenant person who was 79... Mr. Muto, a two-time failed candidate for the head of the Bank of Japan. And they nominated more of their superannuated ancient cronies to be part of this committee. You could see that this was going to go mm -hmm. wrong, that there were, was no one that was going to take responsibility and that this was simply a, a glory trip. And the glory trip is going to cost $2.2 billion in terms of the stadium. Mm -hmm. Uh, when the final numbers have come out about how much this new thing is going to cost, it's going to be the most imp most costly stadium ever built. Right, more than two billion dollars. And two billion dollars, and the public and the people of, of Tokyo and the, the uh, particularly the uh, the governor of Tokyo have all gasped and said, y "You can't, we can't do this." Mm -hmm. And this committee of, 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 of uh, supreme senior citizens have said, no, no, this is the way it's going to work. Right. And now we have this week the prime minister and also the, the minister of education who was, due to his bailiwick, he's actually, he was actually in charge of the Olympics until the new Olympics ministry was, con was created. 
all saying, how did this happen? How did we get here? Wow, this is not good. 55% increase. Oh, it's just, just it, it, what, what happened? Huh? We need to get down and find out who's responsible. Mm -hmm. well, look in the mirrors, guys. Right. You guys are responsible. You created this system and you created this situation. But suddenly, yeah. but buck passing is a fine art in this case. But, uh, yes. Yeah. Well, isn't that a fine example of buck passing? Mm -hmm. I mean, even in Japanese corporate society, people are very reluctant to assume any responsibility. I mean, you find this, we, we discussed. We, look, we have the situation this week with Toshiba. Right. Toshiba, which for years was hiding billions of incorrect and false uh, accounting losses and, and all kinds of different funny fiddles. After years of, of, of investigation, now they're going to have, okay, okay, the, the, the CEO is going to resign. In most countries, all those people would be in jail. Sure, sure. <laughs> and the press reported today that, I mean, earlier in the week, he said, I don't know how this has happened. I didn't tell anybody to do that. I didn't give them an instructions. And the report today was, no, this was an organized fashion and it went under uh, somebody's leadership. Yeah, but, but it had been through many generations mm -hmm. of Toshiba executives. Right. And they all knew that the, the books were funny. Well, isn't this, I mean, I don't know, it's, it's kind of a blanket statement and I don't mean to be pejorative, but isn't this somewhat representative of Japanese companies in general? I mean, uh, the closed system of board memberships, oversight, um, how money is, is uh, hoarded and, and the capital funds are, are used, it's, um, we hear this story all the time. And wouldn't it be weird if that had something to do with the, the LDP's long time stay right. in power. Right. It, that wouldn't have any relationship to that. Mm -hmm. Of course it does. Well, there's no oversight because there's no oversight legislation. And there's... And I mean, look at the Consumer Affairs Agency, how long it took to have one mm -hmm. in Japan, making Japan look like a laughing stock around the world, where consumer affairs was something you dealt with in the 80s. It wasn't until well into the millennium that the first one was established here. Right. And, who, who do they go after right now? You know, makers of, of phony hair products and, and, and these little, uh, you know, fly-by-night tiny companies when there are serious, serious mm -hmm. consumer affairs issues having to do with some of the Japan's big names. Right. Well, getting back to the, um, the stadium issue, the reason why the Tokyo governor and the population of Tokyo is so up in arms is because there is a cost sharing there. Mm -hmm. I mean, the government seems to be able to be in a position to dictate what the design is going to be like and who's going to make it, but when it comes to paying for it, we'll pay our part, and by the way, you're going to pay your part too. That was um, a and, bitter pill to swallow, wasn't it? Well, and when you don't have a viable opposition to vote for, so that you can throw these bums out, yep. take it. You get, to, you get to take it. Yes, but in fact, they are going to modify and change the design of the, the stadium. I would not be surprised if they can completely trash it. Mm -hmm. And they come, they uh, take the loss, whatever it is going to be, uh, to with uh, Ms. Hadid in terms of her design, and they do something completely different because there's simply this can really, really injure mm -hmm. the uh, not just the party but Mr. Abe, and he's waking up to that. He can f he, with the security legislation, he may he may not really care, but the Olympics. He actually cares yes. about it. He's really proud of it, mm -hmm. that he went to Buenos Aires and he made his speech. He lied about Fukushima. It's under control. The nuclear problem is not there. And he brought home the bacon. He brought home the Olympics. Yeah. And he's so proud of that. And if it's a debacle. Yes, well. It is an opportunity, I mean, everybody, I mean, you and I in particular, people who live here in Japan, uh, foreigners who live here and who have invested their life here, we are looking for a repeat of what happened in the 64 Olympic. We want this to propel Japan forward and to do something really dynamic. I mean, uh, along the lines of, you know, the Shinkansen or televisions in every house, I mean, that really crystallized the Japanese you know, economic boom, it'd be nice to see it again. I don't have that much hope in terms of economics, but in certainly in terms of spirit mm -hmm. and in terms of a, let's, let's face it, a national branding issue. Sure. If people come to Japan or see Japan uh, through the Olympics and see the extraordinary le levels of safety, extraordinary levels of technology, of technology extraordinary levels of 
of uh, organization, and most importantly, the fact that people here are extremely kind and 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 extremely open. Mm -hmm. That's that's worth it. Even though people are looking at the account say, "Oh, the Olympics cost sure. this much money and it, it, it lost." For for Japan as a branding as a as a sales point in terms of an international competition for minds and mm -hmm. for hearts, it's worth it. At least uh, if they do it right. If it becomes a boondoggle of vast corporate projects where by you know there's very little in terms of input from the people except as simply as consumers, mm -hmm. then it's going, to be, it's going to be a shameful Olympics indeed. Right. Well, part of the projections uh, predict that if there is a massive change of the design of the stadium, it won't be ready in time for the World Cup of, uh, of rugby that is here. It's, it's a trial case of the Olympics. I mean, they're going to be exercising all the facilities, but the World Cup here in uh, 2019 is a big deal too. Yeah, but the thing is about that is that Japan co-hosted the, the Soccer World Cup in 2002 along with, and those, all those stadiums are still around. Mm -hmm. None of them have been mothballed. They're huge, they, they pose a huge cost. They certainly could be used in a pinch, reassigned various, there doesn't have to be a direct connection between the Olympic venues and the, the Rugby World Cup right. venues. They, they can handle the Rugby World Cup with the stadia that exist already. Mm -hmm. So it, it's really just focused on putting on the show in 2020. The city, the metropolitan government has a pretty good idea, but it's the national group that is completely out of control. Mm -hmm. And we're, there's no, well, maybe if Mr. Abe took direct control of, of the process, but let's face it, he, he appointed directly the people who are in charge right. of it. He's already taken personal responsibility and he blew it. Mm -hmm. Uh, what his personal touch would do in addition to it, one can't say. Okay, well, I don't want to end on a sour note. Okay. Let's, let's just kind of wrap this thing up. Our burning issue today is the LDP, its position of power, how it's stayed in power, how it's managed to continue to lead the, um, well, hopefully, uh, the revitalization of the Japanese economy under what is called now Abenomics. So what positive things can we say about the LDP and their position of power now so that we can nicely wrap up this session of Tokyo on Fire? Mr. Abe has given, and, and the LDP under him, have given Japan something that they haven't had for, well, a decade, which is a leader that other world leaders can rely upon. Mm -hmm. Consistency. After, after Koizumi, we had a, simply a revolving door of prime ministers who lasted a year mm -hmm. and then were out of power. So that there was no, when summits would occur, all the, the other leaders would get together and they say, hi, who, who, who Who's are the new you? Guy? Yes. Who are you? Oh, he's the Japanese prime minister. Oh, hi. <laughs> Won't be seeing you next year. Uh, that, that was de deeply demoralizing mm -hmm. and, and deeply corrosive to Japan's influence around the world. With Mr. Abe and the, the, LD, the kind of LDP that he has now, where there are no rivals and the factions are a minor force, he, pro, he presents to the world the, a consistent face. Mm -hmm. And stability has been one thing that Japan has lacked. Mm -hmm. And with him right now, we have a stable situation. It's ticking off a lot of people right at the, at the current point in time that we're in. But nevertheless, one can look forward to seeing, you know, interactions. For example, what's going on between Mr. Abe and, and Putin. Mr. P the Russian leader would have no reason to talk to any Japanese prime minister for any period of time because that person's going to be gone. But in the case, with Abe interacting with Putin, mm -hmm. and, and Putin will be coming to Japan in defiance of what would seem to be a Western alliance against him, the Japan will be accommodating toward a Putin visit. Without that image of continuity, uh, Japan would not have uh, much weight to, to throw around in the world. Right, and the prime minister is coming up for election now in September, isn't that right? Yeah, but there's almost no one who's Of course, but I mean, it is a, it is a, uh, a hook that you can hang your hat on that, I mean, maybe the uh, diet session was extended so that he could ride on that as well, close up the session successfully and kind of 
paper over an election you guys don't want to run against me, do you? Yeah, right, especially during the middle of the diet session. That's right. Yeah, well, yeah it works perfectly in that regard. Oh. And so he, he, and he'll be reelected, and it's for a three-year term. Mm -hmm. He doesn't have to have ele national elections for that same three years. He's you're, safe. You're safe, and Japan has stability. Mm -hmm. It's not a, a happy stability, necessarily, but at least there is some, some measure of continuity and strength. Terrific. Thank you very much, Michael. With that, I'd like to tie up today's episode of Tokyo on Fire. You've been watching Tokyo on Fire. Our burning issue today that we've handled is the Liberal Democratic Party of Japan, the LDP, how it has stayed in power, where it came from, what kind of dynamics are at play currently as the diet is in session. You can send your comments to us at Twitter using hashtag Tokyo on Fire. You can also add comments to us right in the dialogue box of YouTube, our podcast is downloadable on iTunes, and you can provide comments to us directly at comments at tokyoonfire.com. Thank you very much for watching. Please tell your friends about the podcast. Look forward to seeing you next week. Thank you very much.